one morning, uh, this was uh, Lincoln's birthday in uh, February of 1945, I was told to lead a flight of four down to the Yangtze River to do a river sweep for sampans that ferried uh, equipment for the Japanese. And uh, got down there and got there and instead of seeing a sampan on the water, there was a destroyer. <laughs> and I was the only aircraft in the mission with a bomb on it. So I told the other three to stay up above. I was going to dive bomb this guy and I joined them. So I got into a dive bomb run and I had seen movies of Navy pilots dive bombing where it looked like they were coming up through a snowstorm. And those snowstorms were bullets. And uh, as I was in my dive, one of my flight up above said, Beak, that was my name in flight, Beak, I think you're hitting the coolant because I see a mist out of the airplane. So I looked and the temperature started going up. I dropped my bomb and I started to gain altitude. And at 1,500 feet, I decided I have to either belly land this thing or bail out. For all your flight training, you have gone down the flight line, sat on your parachute, got up, flew your mission, come back, take your parachute off, put your parachute on, sit on for a mission. And you were told, if you have to ever use this, grab that thing and pull it hard and then count to 10. That was the only training we ever had. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and now I had to use it. <laughs> so I got rid of the canopy, stood up in the cockpit to get out, and the wind forced me back. And I'm laying on the back of my P-51, and I'm caught with my feet in the armor plating. I finally get those loose, I see the tail of the 51 go by, and I said, I'm not going to come to 10, and I pulled the ripcord, it opened, and I oscillated once and landed. Wow. It was that close. Oh. Yeah. And uh, two Chinese men came running up to me. Were, were you injured? Was it landing that hard? I was 400 miles behind lines, and I was not hurt landing. And they ran up, and of course they couldn't talk Chinese, and I couldn't talk English. But inside of our flight jacket was a, Jap a Chinese flag with a written message on it from Chiang Kai-shek, the ruler of China at the time, that said, these are guests of our country that are fighting our enemy, and you're to take care of them. So I showed them the inside of this jacket, and one of them could read. And so he said, okay, okay, come with me, come with me. But he kept pointing to my feet. And I realized my feet were bigger than his, but you know, so what? And I finally realized he wanted me to take my shoes off so they couldn't track my feet. Ah. Well, I didn't want to take my shoes off, I was a city boy, and I had tender feet. <laughs> but I did as they asked me to do, and I thought they were going to carry my shoes, but they didn't. And we ran all that day, that night, and finally the next morning we made contact with the gorillas, and my feet were a mess. I had lost all my toenails. Oh and uh, my feet were terrible, so I, I took that we were given sulfur pills to carry with us on our flight in case we were ever shot 
we could use a sofa. And I decided I'm gonna use that sofa on my feet. So I soaked my feet in hot sofa water. And uh, it was a couple of days before I could walk. Uh. But uh, I was well cared for. And the guerrillas went out on missions every day to fight the Japanese. And they would come back to me at night. And so finally I got so I could walk. And we started traveling back, going north towards our base then, uh, which was the Haukau, China. And it was below the city where they found the terracotta warriors. Oh, uh, Xi'an? Yeah, it was south of that, but they hadn't found the warriors yet. Oh, really? No. Oh, wow. So we had no idea what yeah. was there. But anyway, we started walking, and we'd walk from village to village, no roads, in between rice paddies, until we could find another interpreter. And then he would join us. And we kept changing interpreters and walking. They always treated me well. I had great meals, huh. great meals. And at night, of course, the Chinese had no guest bedrooms. And you would come into a village and you would be assigned to sleep in this Chinese couple's house. And they had no guest beds. So we all sat on the, on the, uh, we called sawhorses. And uh, at night when it came time for bed, they took the sawhorses, set them down, and took off the front door. And they that on the sawhorse, and that was my bed. <laughs> and they would put a lot of quilts down, and they, it was soft and good, slept real good. And. Uh, one day, the interpreter was a Chinese colonel, and he could talk fairly good English to where we could converse. And he carried a little white dog. And uh, we would stop for a meal, and he'd reach over to my plate and get some of my food and feed that dog. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Food was scarce, and I really liked dogs, but I wasn't <laughs> too used to feeding them my food. <laughs> but anyway, we did. And one night we came down to dinner, and we sat there, and and we had these plates of Chinese food, and the Chinese colonel last week, how'd you like that dish? He said, that was very good. That was the dog. And he said, how'd you like that dish? I said, that was very good. That was rat. But, you know, it was flesh from the rat, and it was good as it could be. Just they'd never done it before. Yeah, right. So anyway, after so many days, I got back to where they could call a, I want to say A47, but that's not right. But it was the old uh, Boeing, 47, and they called one in to bring us out, fly us out, and I had joined with another pilot that was shot down, and we joined with a Chinese couple to fly out with us. And it turned out that the Chinese lady that we were flying out with was Chiang Kai-shek's niece. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so we flew out and came back to our base. And I was dressed at that time in a Chinese army uniform, came on the base, and nobody at the squadron recognized me, but I finally got my old equipment back together, and, and uh, I was not allowed to fly anymore because I knew so much about the escape route that if uh -huh. I was ever captured again, they would find out what the escape route was like. Now, how long did it take you from the time you were shot down to get back to your base? 30 days. 30 days. 30 wow. days. And uh, so they said, well, we'll send you home. And I said, no, I don't want to go home. 
And they said, we can't find any more missions. I said, well, the war is still on. So I was transferred to the OSS. Oh. And I was... Which, for those that watch this tape, that's the forerunner to our present-day CIA. CIA. Okay. And uh, I was assigned to a unit that trained uh, Americans to go behind lines. 